So the last time I was up here, I gave a really quick kind of behind the scenes peek. I'm going to do that again very briefly. There's some of us here at Odd Salon who spent a lot of time talking about things like narrative structure and pacing and so on. One of the recurring themes that comes up is the habit that a lot of us, that we all have in some form or another to like hide the ball, to not want to spoil the talk. Like we want to keep the punchline a secret. The thought that I'd like to share with you here is that it is almost impossible to spoil a 10 to 15 minute talk. And uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna give you the punchline of my talk up front, which is that the first contact that the pilgrims had with the locals after crossing the Atlantic was to grave rob them. And just so that we're perfectly clear, I'm, here's the timeline. And you can see we're in the introduction right now. And we're going to give some background that gets us up to about 1500. From 1500 to 1620 is roughly when uh, we make the shift from Catholicism to Protestantism to Puritanism, which are basically a splinter group of a splinter group, and then ultimately the pilgrims. And that's where the punchline is going to come in. So it's not going to surprise anybody. Uh, with that in mind, let's get going. So we'll start with the background. Uh, for as long as there's been Christendom, as with many other religions, there's been a question of what do you have to do to get to whatever the optimal afterlife is, right? How do you live your life here such that after you die, you get to go to wherever it is that you want to go? And not always, but one of the common answers, at least in Christendom, as with many other religions, is the doing of good deeds. That if you... Or go to the poor and clothe the ragged, and if you're nice to the kittens, then after you die, you get to go to heaven. Uh, and around 1200, the church had a bright idea, which was, rather than giving money to the poor, or feeding the hungry, or clothing the ragged, that instead, you could just give the money directly to the church in exchange for salvation, and if... Uh, if you didn't have enough money, then at least in certain circumstances, that was that. Uh, this is known as the sale of indulgences. I'd be surprised if most of the people in the room didn't know what indulgences were before coming in here, but it's relevant to this talk, so uh, background information to get everybody caught up. And then also, if you didn't know, from about 1,200 to 1,500, things got much, much worse. However well-intentioned the sale of indulgences may have been to start, there's no question that it went downhill very hard, very fast. Uh, and by the time you get to around 1500, the sale of indulgences is an incredibly common thing. Chaucer wrote about the guy who sold indulgences, and he's one of the most hated characters in the Canterbury Tales with very good reason. So uh, now we get to 1500 when things get a little more hectic and we start to get into the splinter groups of splinter groups away from Catholicism, which will ultimately result in the pilgrims. Uh, here we have a map of Europe. The real schism with the Catholic Church started in Germany, not a place known for getting along with Rome, just historically putting that out there. <laughs> and Martin Luther, who began the Protestant Reformation by protesting, I don't know how else you would do it, who, among other things, said that indulgences are awful, that money for the redemption of your immortal soul is despicable, that the purpose of the church is to be a shepherd guiding the flock to heaven, and instead the church has set itself up as like a gatekeeper, an idolatrous, terrible, greedy gatekeeper who keeps people out unless you can pay the toll. That's awful. And although he was able to get a few things done in Germany and the Protestant Reformation started to take root, it was pretty clear that it wanted someplace else to go, this intellectual movement. The question is just what monarch is going to defy the... Catholic Church, enter England, and our dear friend Henry VIII, who most famously was interested in getting a divorce from his Catholic wife. I'm glossing over a huge amount of stuff here. But what it boils down to in short is that uh, England was ready to try to split away from the Catholic Church. So now we're going to sum up the next four monarchs horrendously briefly. We've got Henry VIII, who was the king who initiated the Church of England, and he then uh, lasted until 1547. His first son, Edward, continued breaking away and going with the Church of England. Uh, after Edward died, Henry's first daughter, Mary I, was Catholic. She was the offspring from his first wife, the Catholic one who he left uh, 
Um, and she was very, very, I'm going to swear, she was very, very unhappy about this whole Church of fucking England thing. Uh, and she went on a murderous crusade to try to make sure that the Church of England would never really be a going concern, but that didn't last for too terribly long, and then Elizabeth I ascended to the throne. There was pressure on her to marry a Catholic prince from the mainland, and a lot of other pressure on her to be Catholic, but that was not going to happen, right? There's different ways to put this, but basically the reason the Church of England was created was so that she could be born. You were not going to convince her to turn her back on the church. Um, and with all these pressures going on, Elizabeth's response to the question of how is the Catholic Church going to survive in England and how is the Church of England going to operate was basically just to say, listen, we all just have to get along. And in one of the more surprisingly liberal religious and political policies of the time, Elizabeth basically said, listen, you can join the Church of England or you can pay us a tithe, basically pay a fee, and if you swear your allegiance, you don't have to be Church of England, just we want to make sure that you are not being a horrible jerk about things. Again, radical oversimplification. Uh, but it worked really well, and Elizabeth is still pretty fondly remembered to this day for her religious tolerance, uh, which gets us to the Puritans, which is the splinter group that later became the Pilgrims, right, the Puritans were not into this whole tolerance thing. Uh, they didn't like the Catholic Church. They didn't like anything that had to do with the Catholic Church, and they didn't like anybody who liked the Catholic Church. Uh, they wanted a faith that was pure, thus the name Puritans. How did you not see that coming? And they were extraordinarily hostile, many of them, to the Queen and to the Church of England, a uh, cute side story. They were so, so angry about this that a couple of them were actually sentenced to death for sedition and then reprieved and then were at it again and got sentenced to death a second time, were reprieved a second time, right? This is while the Inquisition is still happening in mainland Europe. Uh, sentenced and reprieved twice and then after the second time, they were at it again. It was finally, right, if you, it's really just a matter of you're going to play well with others or die. You have chosen death. We understand, and you're done. Um, and the... the <laughs> you're gone. So uh, the Puritans also kind of famously developed this hostile attitude towards anything that might be considered fun. Um, the members of the church were not allowed to participate in sports. You weren't allowed to go to the theater. Music was strongly discouraged and strictly forbidden during church services. It was just hard-working devotion to the Lord 24-7 or else you're gone. Yeah. Uh, that's right. Fun things were right out. And then in 1603, Her Royal Majesty Queen Elizabeth I died. Things started to get very hectic. Again, the broad gloss is that the fate of religion in England was very much in question after Elizabeth died. And there was a very real chance that some of the Catholics would rise to power again. And the Protest I'm sorry, the Puritans had spent enough time talking about how the Catholics all have to be killed to at least some of them decided that it was, it was time to go. Uh, to go to someplace safer. So this begins the part where they become the pilgrims. They really viewed themselves as the inheritors of the mission of Exodus, the, the kind of Moses quest to have a holy land in the world and that they were going to go on a pilgrimage to try to do that. So the first place they went was the Netherlands because it was right across the channel and because the Dutch were nice enough people to not just kill the pilgrims as soon as they landed. Uh, as it turns out, the Dutch were, for the most part, pretty friendly. Uh, being a very socially liberal population, they were not very agreeable to the whole business of extremist religious intolerance. Um, it turns out, also, th th they didn't speak English, most of them. <laughs> and it's not like the pilgrims were going to the theater to learn the local language, right? Uh, they spent a number of years there, and as time passed, it became clear that the Dutch were tolerating them, but that the Dutch were not particularly interested in engaging them in deep theological discussions. And as time passed, it also turns out that a lot of the especially younger Dutch discovered that this whole, like, nice world thing can be pretty sweet, and you don't have to be a jerk all the time. And uh, it was clear that if they stayed there for too long, that uh, 
they were at risk of becoming nice. <laughs> so they uh, decided to leave. Uh, and after a uh, certain amount of discussions with one another, they decided that the thing to do would be to travel to the New World, which was being slowly colonized at the time, uh, but was mostly abandoned by people who could at least speak the language that they spoke. Um, so the first thing that they need is a ship. So they got one. Thank you. Yes, my dry brushing technique is splendid. Uh, and then they sailed across the Atlantic. The crossing was not an especially easy journey. This will become relevant. Um, yeah, a lot of them were sick, a lot of them died, uh, and there was starvation that was going on, but you're already on your way, so turning around isn't that great an idea. Uh, ultimately, they spotted land, and they sure enough landed. The, we're almost at the grave robbing. <laughs> the first thing that they really did was to build a little shelter, and then after they had the shelter built, they sent out a... Search party. Ha <laughs> ha And when they, the first search party that went out discovered a burial ground that the locals had where reams of corn were interred alongside the dead. And um, starving and confused and low on resources is the excuse, and you can decide for yourself whether that's a reasonable excuse or not. Um, but for sure, upon discovering the corn, they uh, <laughs> checked to make sure that nobody was watching and made off with it. Uh, weird coincidence, then they laid low for about two weeks and then sent out a second search party. And the second search party found a second burial ground that also had reams of corn interred alongside it. And uh, a repeat of the first bit, sure enough. They made off with the second ream of corn. At this point, they were pretty scared about possible retribution from the locals, having grave robbed them twice before having even met them. Uh, on their third venture out, they actually did meet some of the locals and uh, opened fire, which is almost like a Monty Python skit, right? The burn third one burned down, fell over, and then sang into the swamp. But the fourth encounter went moderately well. Uh, they discovered... a. Uh, local who, for reasons totally not worth going into right now, spoke a little bit of English, who kind of helped them, but the long-term summary is that those first three encounters basically nicely encapsulate their treatment of the local population during the entirety of their stay in this country. Yeah. Um, so the Plymouth Colony ultimately became a real going concern. A few notes about the pilgrims and what was going on with them. Um, they hated Christmas, it turns out. Interesting touch. Uh, the pilgrims were of the opinion that Christmas was an idolatrous pagan holiday that had been co-opted by the Catholic Church as basically a glorified PR stunt, which is not wrong. <laughs> and they also said that although it was supposedly for the glory of the Lord, that mostly what people used it for was drinking and revelry, which again, not <laughs> you're not wrong. Um, they took a really dim view of tolerance as additional people came over. There was a Quaker settlement nearby. The Quakers were a much more friendly, tolerant people. The pilgrims in Plymouth Colony said, if you're Quaker, you're not allowed here on pain of death, which is kind of indicative. Um, the running narrative is that the pilgrims were seeking religious freedom, but they were really seeking the freedom to be as like intolerant as they wanted to be. Um, there was an interesting, weird little bit of female empowerment going on, and I say weird because it's nestled inside of the idea that the God-determined function of women is to procreate, which is pretty standard for certainly faiths during this period of time. The trick is they took this very seriously, and what that meant was that women could sue for divorce and did in much higher percentages than women in other Christian faiths based on the idea that Right, premarital sex is not allowed, so you can't test the guy out. And if he is incapable of assisting you in performing your God-given function, then you just need to find another guy. <laughs> 
Um, and given that the male to female ratio of the Plymouth Colony was something like eight to one, there were certainly other guys who were available who were presumably up to the task. Um, and then they also finally addressed the question of kind of good deeds, not just indulgences, but doing good deeds, and how do you get to heaven? And the pilgrim answer was, there's nothing that you can do to ensure that you go to heaven. Good deeds are worthless. Uh, that God is, this is only a slight exaggeration, that heaven is the domain of the divine and there is nothing that you can do to force God to do anything. The best that you can do is devote your entire life tirelessly to the glorification of the Lord and then maybe you will get in, but probably not. That's just how it is. You can certainly do plenty of things to ensure that you will never go there but mostly you just need to live in terror of the divine and keep your fingers crossed. There's these weird little, I'm almost at the end here, there's these weird little nuggets that you find when you do this research. And there's, there's this thing where people from, from many different linguistic cultures will name their children and name their daughters particularly after virtues, right? Like charity or hope or joy. Uh, there is a surviving record of a little pilgrim girl named Fear. <laughs> which, I can't imagine, dating was really great <laughs> for that kid. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to send you off on a good note. It turns out, though, most of the people who are participating, who were the subjects of this talk, were um, kind of jerks. But it turns out they were not the only people who came from the European continent or from England to here, and there are a lot of other cultures that got brought over as well. So I invite you to raise your glass to some of the more fun-loving drama stage theatrical people on behalf of Odd Salon. My name is Arthur, and thank you very much.